tales for dark nights. The Monkey's Paw by W. W. Jacobs Narrated by Peter Bishop 1. Without, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlour of Laburnum Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his king in such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. Hark at that wind, said Mr. White, who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. I'm listening, said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. Check. I should hardly think he'd come tonight, said his father, with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out, bawled Mr. White, with sudden and unlooked-for violence. Of all the beastly, slushy, out-of-the-way places to live in, this is the worst. Pathways a bog and the road's a torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses in the road are let, they think it doesn't matter. Never mind, dear, said his wife soothingly. Perhaps you'll win the next one. Mr. White looked up sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin grey beard. There he is, said Herbert White, as the gate banged to loudly and heavy footsteps came toward the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste, and, opening the door, was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with himself, so that Mrs. White said, Tut tut, and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris, he said, introducing him. The Sergeant Major shook hands, and taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contentedly while his host got out whiskey and tumblers and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass, his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk, the little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of the wild scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. He don't look to have taken much harm, said Mrs. White, politely. I'd like to go to India myself, said the old man. Just to look around a bit, you know. Better where you are, said the Sergeant Major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and, sighing softly, shook it again. I should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers, said the old man. What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Nothing, said the soldier hastily. Leastways, nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw? said Mrs. White, curiously. Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the Sergeant Major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absent-mindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again. His host filled it for him. To look at it, said the Sergeant Major, fumbling in his pocket. It's just an ordinary little paw dried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. 
And what is there special about it? inquired Mr. White as he took it from his son, and having examined it, placed it upon the table. It had a spell brought on it by an old fakir, said the sergeant major. A very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. <laughs> his manner was so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter jarred somewhat. Well, why don't you have three, sir? said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him in the way that Middle Age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. I have, he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the three wishes granted? asked Mrs. White. I did, said the sergeant major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. And has anybody else wished? persisted the old lady. The first man had his three wishes, yes, was the reply. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the paw. His tones were so grave that a hush fell upon the group. If you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now then, Morris, said the old man at last. What'd you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It has caused enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them. And those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterward. If you could have another three wishes, said the old man, eyeing him keenly. Would you have them? I don't know, said the other. I don't know. He took the paw and dangling it between his forefinger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. White, with a sudden cry, stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn, said the soldier solemnly. If you don't want it, Morris, said the other, give it to me. I won't, said his friend doggedly. I threw it on the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire again like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. How do you do it? He inquired. Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I warn you of the consequences. Sounds like the Arabian Nights, said Mrs. White as she rose and began to set the supper. Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me? Her husband drew the talisman from pocket, and then all three burst into laughter as the sergeant major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. If you must wish, he said gruffly, wish for something sensible. Mr. White dropped it back in his pocket and placing chairs, motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second installment of the soldier's adventures in India. If the tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those he has been telling us, said Herbert as the door closed behind their guest, just in time for him to catch the last train, we shan't make much out of it. Did you give him anything for it, father? inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. A trifle, he said, colouring slightly. He didn't want it, but I made him take it, and he pressed me again to throw it away. Likely, said Herbert with pretend horror. Why, we're going to be rich and famous and happy. Wish to be an emperor father to begin with, then you can't be henpecked. He darted round the table, pursued by the maligned Mrs. White, armed with an antimacassar. 
Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact, he said slowly. It seems to me I've got all I want. If you only cleared that house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. Well, wish for two hundred pounds then. That'll just do it. His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credulity, held up the talisman, and his son, with a solemn face somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down at the piano and struck a few impressive chords. I wish for two hundred pounds, said the old man distinctly. A fine crash from the piano greeted the words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. His wife and son ran toward him. It moved, he cried, with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. As I wished, it twisted in my hand like a snake. Well, I don't see the money, said his son as he picked it up and placed it on the table. And I bet I never shall. It must have been your fancy, father," said his wife, regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. Never mind, though. There's no harm done. It gave me a shock all the same. They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside, the wind was higher than ever, and the old man started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence unusual and depressing settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. I expect you'll find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed," said Herbert as he bade them good night. And something horrible squatting up on top of the wardrobe, watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains. He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last face was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that, with a little uneasy laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed. Two. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning, as it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room which it had lacked on the previous night, and the dirty, shrivelled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. I suppose all old soldiers are the same," said Mrs. White. "The idea of our listening to such nonsense." How could wishes be granted in these days? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt you, father? Might drop on his head from the sky," said a frivolous Herbert. "Morris said the things happen so naturally," said his father, "that you might, if you so wished, attribute it to coincidence." "Well, don't break into the money before I come back," said Herbert as he rose from the table. I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man, and we shall have to disown you. <laughs> His mother laughed, and following him to the door, watched him down the road. And returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity. All of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant majors of bibulous habits when she found that the post had brought a tailor's bill. Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home," she said as they sat at dinner. "I dare say," said Mr. White, pouring himself out some beer. "But for all that, the thing moved in my hand. That I'll swear to." "You thought it did," said the old lady soothingly. "I say it did," replied the other. "There was no thought about it. It had just..." What's the matter? His wife made no reply. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside, who, 
appearing in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the 200 pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate and then walked on again. A fourth time he stood with his hand upon it and then with a sudden resolution flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White, at the same moment, placed her hands behind her and hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron, put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologized for the appearance of the room and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden. She then waited as patiently as her sex would permit for him to broach his business, but he was at first strangely silent. I was asked to call, he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. I come from Ma and Megan's. The old lady started. Is anything the matter? She asked breathlessly. Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it? Her husband interposed. Tell her mother, he said hastily. Sit down and don't jump to conclusions. You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir. And he eyed the other wistfully. I'm sorry, began the visitor. Is he hurt? demanded the mother wildly. The visitor bowed in assent. Badly hurt, he said quietly. But he is not in any pain. Oh, thank God, said the old woman, clasping her hands. Thank God for that thing. She broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's averted face. She caught her breath and, turning to her slower-witted husband, laid her trembling old hand upon his. There was a long silence. You was caught in the machinery, said the visitor at length in a low voice. Caught in the machinery, repeated Mr. White in a dazed fashion. Yes. He sat staring blankly out at the window and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days nearly forty years before. He was the only one left to us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It is hard. <clears throat> the other coughed and rising walked slowly to the window. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, he said without looking round. I beg that you will understand that I am only their servant and merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The old woman's face was white, her eyes staring and her breath inaudible. On the husband's face was a look such as his friend the sergeant might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Ma and Megan's disclaim all responsibility, continued the other. They admit no liability at all, but in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand, and rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words. How much? Two hundred pounds, was the answer. <coughs> Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. Three. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead, and came back to a house steeped in shadow and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realize it and remained in a state of expectation as though of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load too heavy for old hearts to bear. 
But the days passed, and expectations gave place to resignation. The hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back, he said tenderly. You will be cold. It is colder for my son, said the old woman, and wept afresh. The sound of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm, and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully, and then slept until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw! She cried wildly. The monkey's paw! He started up in alarm. Where, where is it? What's the matter? She came stumbling across the room toward him. I want it, she said quietly. You've not destroyed it. It's in the parlor on the bracket, he replied, marveling. Why? She cried and laughed together, and bending over, kissed his cheek. I only just thought of it, she said hysterically. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what? He questioned. The other two wishes, she replied rapidly. We've only had one. Was that not enough? He demanded fiercely. No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly and wish our boy alive again. The man sat up in bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking limbs. Good God, you are mad! He cried, aghast. Get it! She panted. Get it quickly and wish. Oh, my boy, my boy! Her husband struck a match and lit the candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You don't know what you're saying. We had the first wish granted," said the old woman feverishly. "Why not the second?" "A coincidence," stammered the old man. "Go and get it and wish," cried his wife, quivering with excitement. The old man turned and regarded her, and his voice shook. "He has been dead ten days, and besides, he—I would not tell you else, but..." I could only recognize him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back! Cried the old woman and dragged him toward the door. Do you think I fear the child I have nursed? He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor, and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place. And a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him, and he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way round the table and groping along the wall until he found himself in a small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant. And to his fears, seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish, she cried in a strong voice. It is foolish and wicked, he faltered. Wish, repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor, and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank, trembling, into a chair as the old woman, with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. 
The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls, until, with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute or two afterward the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches and, striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs the match went out, and he paused to strike another, and at the same moment a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? cried the old woman, starting up. A rat, said the old man in shaking tones. A rat, it passed me on the stairs. His wife sat up in bed listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. It's Herbert! It's Herbert! She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by her arm, held her tightly. What are you going to do? He whispered hoarsely. It's my boy! It's Herbert! She cried, struggling mechanically. I forgot it was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let go! I must open the door! For God's sake, don't let it in! cried the old man, trembling. You are afraid of your own son! She cried, struggling. Let me go! I'm coming, Herbert! I'm coming! There was another knock, and another. The old woman, with a sudden wrench, broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice, strained and panting. The bolt! She cried loudly. Come down, I can't reach it! But her husband was on his hands and knees groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back, and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although the echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back, and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him the courage to run down to her side, and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe Performed by Jeff Clement Audio production and music by Nick Ledesma For the most wild yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it, in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet, mad am I not, and very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow, I die, and today, I would unburden my soul. 
My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have represented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than Baroque's. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive, in the circumstances I detail with awe, nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition, my tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals, and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time, and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth, and in my manhood, I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute, which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early, and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point, and I mention the matter at all for no better reason than that it happens just now to be remembered. Pluto this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me whenever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance, had, I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew, day by day, more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife. At length, I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when by accident or through affection they came in my way. But my disease grew upon me, for what disease is like alcohol? And at length, even Pluto, who was now becoming old, and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home, much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him 
when, in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed, at once, to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, gin nurtured, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. I blush. I burn. I shudder when I pen the damnable atrocity. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse, for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was, at best, a feeble and equivocal feeling and the soul remained untouched. I plunged again into excess, and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but, as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came, as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit, philosophy takes no account. Yet, I am not more sure that my soul lives. That I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart, one of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man. Who has not, a hundred times, found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the wrong's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cold blood, I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree, hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart, hung it because I knew that it had loved me and because I felt it had given me no reason of offense, hung it because I knew that in so doing I was committing a sin, a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it as if such a thing were possible even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. On the night of the day in which this cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforward to despair. 
I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity, but I am detailing a chain of facts and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house and against which had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here, in great measure, resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to its having been recently spread. About this wall, a dense crowd were collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager anticipation. The words strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw as if graven in bas-relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme. But at length, reflection came to my aid. The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon hearing the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd, by someone of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from my sleep. The falling of other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished the portraiture as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just detailed, it did not less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and during this period there came back to my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal, and to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented for another pet of the same species and of somewhat similar appearance with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat, half stupefied, in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had no sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white, covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it from the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caress, and when I prepared to go home, the animal evidenced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it 
arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated, but I know not how or why it was. Its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not, for some weeks, strike or otherwise violently ill-use it, but gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing and to flee silently from its odious presence as from the breath of a pestilence. What added, no doubt, to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, it had also been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I have already said, possessed, in a high degree, that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down, or, fastening its long and sharp claws in my dress, clamor in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from so doing, partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I am almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon's cell I am almost ashamed to own, that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had, at length, assumed a rigorous distinctiveness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, and for this, above all, I loathed and dreaded and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing of the gallows. O oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and crime, of agony and of death. And now was I indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity, and a brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me a man fashioned in the image of the high god, so much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former, the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face, and its vast weight an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off. 
incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole intimates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. The moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind, while from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outbursts of a fury to which I now blindly abandon myself, my uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers. One day, she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs, and nearly throwing me headlong exasperated me to madness. Uplifting an axe and forgetting, in my wrath, the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand, I aimed a blow at the animal which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife, goaded by the interference into a rage more than demonical. I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell, dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house either by day or by night without risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period, I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. At another, I resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar. Again, I deliberated about casting it into the well in the yard, about packing it in a box as if merchandise with the usual arrangements, and so getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. I determined to wall it up in the cellar, as the monks of the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up as before so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar, I easily dislodged the bricks, and, having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position, while, with little trouble, I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair, with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with this I very carefully went over the new brickwork. When I had finished, I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here at last, then, my labor has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had at length 
firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it at the moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate. But it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep, the blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. And thus for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and the third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a freeman. The monster in terror had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries had been made, but these had been readily answered. Even a search had been instituted, but of course nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of the police came, very unexpectedly, into the house and proceeded again to make a rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, was the inscrutability of my place of concealment. I felt no embarrassment whatever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. Oh, the glee in my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say, if but one word, by way of triumph, and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Gentlemen, I said at last, as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this this is a very well-constructed house. In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say an excellently well-constructed house. These walls... Are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado... I rapped heavily, with a cane which I held in my hand, upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch-fiend. No sooner had the reverberations of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb by a cry, at first muffled and broken like the sobbing of a child and then quickly swelling into one long, loud and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and unhuman. A howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell conjointly from the throats of the damned and their agony and the demons that exalted the damnation. Of my own thoughts, it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless, through extremity of terror and awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect 
before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cast and crew in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Gentlemen, we now bring to you our host and the star of this broadcast, Mr. Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busy themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied. Perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the stranching creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet, across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that to our minds, as ours are, to the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the great disillusionment. It was near the end of October. Business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. Sales were picking up. On this particular evening, October 30th, the Crossley Service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radios. For the next 24 hours, not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia, causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We now take you to the Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. From the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel in New York City, we bring you the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. With a touch of a Spanish... Ramon Raquello leads off with La Campasita. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving towards the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel, situated in downtown New York.
And now a tune that never loses favor, the ever-popular Stardust. Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with noted astronomer Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on the event. In a few moments, we will take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, New Jersey. We return you until then to the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. ready to take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Carl Phillips speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. I'm standing in a large, semicircular room, pitch black except for an oblong split in the ceiling. Through this opening, I can see a sprinkling of stars that cast a kind of frosty glow over the intricate mechanisms of the huge telescope. The ticking sound you hear is the vibration of the clockwork. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform, peering through a giant lens. I ask you to be patient, ladies and gentlemen, during any delay that may arise during our interview. Besides his ceaseless watch of the heavens, Professor Pearson may be interrupted by telephone or other communications. During this period, he is in constant touch with the astronomical centers of the world. Professor, may I begin our questions? At any time, Mr. Phillips. Uh, professor, would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. A red disk swimming in a blue sea. Transverse stripes across the disk. Quite distinct now because Mars happens to be the point nearest the Earth. In opposition, as we call it. In your opinion, what do these transverse stripes signify, Professor Pearson? Dark canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips. Although that's the popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions peculiar to the planet. Then you are quite convinced as a scientist that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars? I'd say the chances against it are a thousand to one. And yet, how do you account for those gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Mr. Phillips, I cannot account for it. By the way, Professor, for the benefit of our listeners, how far is Mars from Earth? Approximately 40 million miles. Well, that seems a safe enough distance. Thank you. Uh, uh, ju uh, just a moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen, someone has just handed Professor Pearson a message. While he reads it, let me remind you that we are speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we are interviewing the world-famous astronomer Professor Pearson. One moment, please. Professor Pearson has passed me a message which he has just received. Professor, may I read the message to the listening audience? Certainly, Mr. Phillips. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I shall read you a wire addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Gray of the National History Museum, New York. 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, seismograph registered shock of almost earthquake intensity occurring within a radius of 20 miles of Princeton. Please investigate, signed Lloyd Gray, Chief of Astronomical Division. Professor Pearson, could this occurrence possibly have something to do with the disturbances observed on the planet Mars? Hardly, Mr. Phillips. This is probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this particular time is merely a coincidence. However, we shall conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past ten minutes, we've been speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton, 
bringing you a special interview with Professor Pearson, noted astronomer. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are returning you now to our New York studio. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News, Toronto, Canada. Professor Morris of McGill University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. Now, nearer home comes a special announcement from Trenton, New Jersey. It's reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word description as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millett and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. We take you now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again at the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself may be 11 miles from Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I, I hardly know where to begin to paint for you a word picture of the strange scene before my eyes, like something out of a modern uh, Arabian Nights. Well, I, I just got here. I, I haven't had the chance to look around yet. I guess that's it. Yes, that's the thing directly in front of me, half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of a tree it must have struck on its way down. What I can see of the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor, at least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. It has a diameter of, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say, what is the, the diameter? Uh, about 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheath is, well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish white. Curious spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. They're getting in front of my line of vision. Uh, would you mind standing to one side, please? Hey, one side there. One side. While the policemen are pushing the crowd back, here's Mr. Wilmus, owner of the farm here. He may have some interesting facts to add. Mr. Wilmoth, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that dropped into your backyard? Step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmoth. Well, I was listening to the radio. Uh, closer and louder, please. Uh, pardon me? Uh, louder, please, and, and closer. Well, yes, sir. Uh, well, I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsing. That professor fellow was talking about Mars. So I was half dozing and half... Yes, yes, Mr. Wilmoth. Then what happened? As I was saying, I, I was listening to the radio kind of half ways. Yes, Mr. Wilmoth. And then you saw something. Not first off. Uh, I heard something. And what did you hear? A hissing sound, like this. Kind of like a Fourth of July rocket. Then what? Turned my head out the window and would have swore I was to sleep and dreaming. Yes? Well, I, I seen a kind of greener streak and, and didn't sing all. Something smacked the ground. Knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Wilmer? Well, I, I ain't quite sure. I reckon I, I was kind of riled. Thank you, Mr. Wilmer. Thank you. A well, moment to tell you some more? No, that's quite all right. That's, that's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmoth 
owner of the farm where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us. Police are trying to rope off the roadway leading to the farm, but it's no use. They're breaking right through. Cars' headlights throw an enormous spot on the pit where the object's half buried. Some of the more daring souls are now venturing near the edge. Their silhouettes stand out against the metal sheen. One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with a policeman. The policeman wins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but now it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio? Listen. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll move the microphone nearer. Now we're not more than 25 feet away. Can you hear it now? Oh, Professor Pearson. Yes, Mr. Phillips. Can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial, not found on this Earth. Friction with the Earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and, as you can see, of cylindrical shape. Just a minute. Something's happening. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. The end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw. The thing must be hollow. Oh. Oh, she's moving. Look, the darn thing comes brewing. Get back there. Get no. back, I tell you. Oh. Oh. Maybe there's men in it trying to escape. It's red hot. It's still burned to a cinder. Oh. Get back there. Keep those idiots back. Uh. She's off. The top's loose. Look out there. Stand back. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Someone's crawling out of the hollow top. Someone or something. I can see peering out of that black hole two luminous disks. Are they eyes? It, it, it might be a face. It might be... Good heavens. Something's wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Uh, and now it's another one. And another. They look like tentacles to me. There. I can see the thing's body. Uh, it's large. Large as a bear. And it glistens like wet leather. But that face. It. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen. It's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. The eyes are black and, and gleam like a serpent. The, the mouth is V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. The monster, or whatever it is, can, can hardly move. It seems weighed down by possibly gravity or something. The, oh, the thing's raising up. The crowd falls back now. They, they've seen plenty. This is the most extraordinary experience. I, I can't find words. I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. Uh, I'll have to stop the description until I can take a new position. Uh, hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. bringing you an eyewitness account of what's happening on the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. We now return you to Carl Phillips at Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, am I on? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here I am back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmoth's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I 
I will give you every detail as long as I can talk, as long as I can see. More state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit, about 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain is conferring with someone. We can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, yes, it is. Now they've parted. The professor moves around one side, studying the object, while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a, it's a white handkerchief tied to a pole, a flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait, something's happening. Uh, a humped shape is uh, rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? Uh, there's a jet of, of flame springing from the mirror. And it leaps right at the advancing men. And it strikes them head on. Good Lord! They're turning into flame! Now the, the whole field caught fire! The woods! The, the, the barns! The gas tanks of automobiles! are spreading everywhere! It's coming this way! About 20 yards to my left! Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Endelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We now continue with our piano interlude. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been handed a message that came in from Grover's Mill by telephone. Just a moment. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, lie dead in a field east of the village of Grover's Mill. Their bodies burned and distorted beyond all possible recognition. The next voice you hear will be that of Brigadier General Montgomery Smith, commander of the state militia at Trenton, New Jersey. I've been requested by the governor of New Jersey to place the counties of Mercer and Middlesex as far west as Princeton and east to Jamesburg under martial law. No one will be permitted to enter this area except by special pass issued by state or military authorities. Four companies of state militia are proceeding from Trenton to Grover's Mill and will aid in the evacuation of homes within the range of military operations. Thank you. You have just been listening to General Montgomery Smith commanding the state militia at Trenton. In the meantime, further details of the catastrophe at Grover's Mill are coming in. The strange creatures, after unleashing their deadly assault, crawled back into their pit and made no attempt to prevent the efforts of firemen to recover the bodies and extinguish the fire. Combined fire departments of Mercer County are fighting the flames which menace the entire countryside. We have been unable to establish any contact with our mobile unit at Grover's Mill, but we hope to be able to return you there at the earliest possible moment. In the meantime, we take you... Just a moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been informed that we have finally established communication with an eyewitness of the tragedy. Professor Pearson has been located at a farmhouse near Grover's Mill, where he has established an emergency observation post. As a scientist, he will give you his explanation of the calamity. The next voice you hear will be that of Professor Pearson, brought to you by Direct Wire. Professor Pearson. Of the creatures in the rocket cylinder at Grover's Mill, I can give you no authoritative information, either as to their nature, their origin, or their purposes here on Earth. Of their destructive instrument, I might venture some conjectural explanation. For want of a better term, I shall refer to the mysterious weapon as a heat ray. It's all too evident that these creatures have scientific knowledge far in advance of our own. It is my guess that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat 
in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as the mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. That is my conjecture of the origin of the heat ray. Thank you, Professor Pearson. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a bulletin from Trenton. There's a brief statement informing us that the charred body of Carl Phillips has been identified in a Trenton hospital. Now, here's another bulletin from Washington, D.C. Office of the Director of the National Red Cross reports 10 units of Red Cross emergency workers have been assigned to the headquarters of the state militia stationed outside Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Here's a bulletin from state police, Princeton Junction. The fires at Grover's Mill and vicinity are now under control. Scouts report all quiet in the pit, no sign of life appearing from the mouth of the cylinder. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special statement from Mr. Harry McDonald, Vice President in Charge of Operations. We have received a request from the militia at Trenton to place at their disposal our entire broadcasting facilities. In view of the gravity of the situation, and believing that radio has a responsibility to serve in the public interest at all times, we are turning over our facilities to the state militia at Trenton. We take you now to the field headquarters of the state militia near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. This is Captain Lansing of the Signal Corps, attached to the state militia, now engaged in military operations in the vicinity of Grover's Mill. Situation arising from the reported presence of certain individuals of unidentified nature is now under complete control. The cylindrical object, which lies in a pit directly below our position, is surrounded on all sides by eight battalions of infantry, without heavy field pieces, but adequately armed with rifles and machine guns. All cause for alarm, if such cause ever existed, is now entirely unjustified. The things, whatever they are, do not even venture to poke their heads above the pit. I can see their hiding place plainly in the glare of the searchlights here. With all their reported resources, these creatures can scarcely stand up against heavy machine gun fire. Anyway, it's an interesting outing for the troops. I can make out their khaki uniforms, crossing back and forth in front of the lights. It looks almost like a real war. There appears to be some slight smoke in the woods bordering the Millstone River, probably started by campers. Well, we ought to see some action soon. One of the companies is deploying on the left flank. A quick thrust and it will all be over. Now, wait a minute. I see something on top of the cylinder. No, it's nothing but a shadow. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmoth Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on an old metal tube. Wait. That wasn't a shadow. It's something moving. Solid metal. Kind of a shield-like affair rising up out of the cylinder. It's going higher and higher. Why, it's... It's standing on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees, and the searchlights are on it. Hold on. announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The battle which took place tonight at Grover's Mill has ended in one of the most startling defeats ever suffered by an army in modern times. 7,000 men armed with rifles and machine guns pitted against a single fighting machine of the invaders from Mars. 120 known survivors. The rest strewn over the battle area from Grover's Mill to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death under the metal feet of the monster, or burned to cinders by its heat ray. The monster is now in control of the middle section of New Jersey and has effectively cut the state through its center. 
Communications lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Railroad tracks are torn and service from New York to Philadelphia discontinued, except routing some of the trains through Allentown and Phoenixville. Highways to the north, south, and west are clogged with frantic human traffic. Police and army reserves are unable to control the mad flight. By morning, the fugitives will have swelled. Philadelphia, Camden, and Trenton it is estimated to twice the normal population. At this time, martial law prevails throughout New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. We take you now to Washington for a special broadcast on the national emergency. The Secretary of the Interior. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. However, I wish to impress upon you, private citizens and public officials, all of you, the urgent need of calm and resourceful action. Fortunately, this formidable enemy is still confined to a comparatively small area, and we may place our faith in the military forces to keep them there. In the meantime, placing our faith in God, we must continue the performance of our duties, each and every one of us, so that we may confront this destructive adversary with a nation united, courageous, and consecrated to the preservation of human supremacy on this earth. I thank you. You've just heard the Secretary of the Interior speaking from Washington. Bulletins too numerous to read are piling up in the studio here. We are informed the central portion of New Jersey is blacked out from radio communication due to the effect of the heat ray upon power lines and electrical equipment. There is a special bulletin from New York. Cables received from English, French, German scientific bodies offering assistance. Astronomers report continued gas outburst at regular intervals on planet Mars. Majority voice opinion that enemy will be reinforced by additional rocket machines. Attempts made to locate Professor Pearson of Princeton, who has observed Martians at close range. It is feared he was lost in recent battle. Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report three Martian machines visible above treetops, moving north towards Somerville with population fleeing ahead of them. Heat ray not in use, although advancing at express train speed, invaders pick their way carefully. They seem to be making conscious effort to avoid destruction of cities and countryside. However, they stop to uproot power lines, bridges, and railroad tracks. Their apparent objective is to crush resistance, paralyze communication, and disorganize human society. Here's a bulletin from Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Coon hunters have stumbled upon a second cylinder similar to the first embedded in the Great Swamp 20 miles south of Morristown. Army field pieces are proceeding from Newark to blow up second invading unit before cylinder can be opened and the fighting machine rigged. They are taking a position in the foothills of Wachung Mountains. Another bulletin from Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report enemy machines, now three in number, increasing speed northward, kicking over houses and trees in their evident haste to form a conjunction with their allies south of Morristown. Machines also sighted by telephone operator east of Middlesex within 10 miles of Plainfield. Here's a bulletin from Winston Field, Long Island. Fleet of Army bombers carrying heavy explosives flying north in pursuit of enemy. Scouting planes act as guides. They keep speeding enemy in sight. Just a moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we've run special wires to the artillery line in adjacent villages to give you direct reports in the zone of the advancing enemy. First, we take you to the battery of the 22nd Field Artillery, located in the Wachung Mountains. Range, 32 meters. 32 meters. Projection, 39 degrees. 39 degrees. Fire! One hundred and forty yards to the right, sir. Ship range, thirty-one meters. Thirty-one meters. Projection, thirty-seven degrees. Thirty-seven degrees. Fire. A hit, sir. We got the tripod of one of them. They've stopped. The, the others are trying to repair it. Quick, get the range. Shift 30 meters. 30 meters. Projection, 27 degrees. 27 degrees. Fire! Can't, can't see the shell land, sir. They're letting off a smoke. What is it? A black smoke, sir. 
Moving this way, lying close to the ground. It's moving fast. Put on gas masks. Get ready to fire. Shift 24 meters. 24 meters. Projection. 24 degrees. 24 degrees. Fire! Still can't see, sir. Smoke's coming near. Get the range. <coughs> 23 meters. 23 meters. 23 meters. Projection. 22 degrees. 22 degrees. Bombing plane, Victor, 843 off Bayonne, New Jersey. Lieutenant Boat, commanding eight bombers. Reporting to Commander Fairfax, Langham Field. This is Boat, reporting to Commander Fairfax, Langham Field. Enemy tripod machines now in sight. Reinforced by three machines from Morristown Cylinder. Six all together. One machine already crippled, believed hit by a shell from Army Gun in Wachung Mountains. Guns now appear silent. A heavy black fog hanging close to the earth of extreme density. Nature unknown. No sign of heat ray. Enemy now turns east, crossing Passaic River into the Jersey marshes. Another straddles the Pulaski Skyway. Evident objective is New York City. They're pushing down a high tension power station. The machines are closed together now and we're ready to attack. Plane circling, ready to strike. A thousand yards and we'll be over the first. Eight hundred yards. Six hundred. Four hundred. Two hundred. There they go. The giant arm raised. Green flash. The spring up to flame. Two thousand feet. Engines are giving out. No chance to release bombs. Only one thing left. Drop on them. Plane it all. We got another first one. Got the engines gone. Eight. This is Bam, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. This is Bam, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Come in, please. This is Langham Field. Go ahead. Eight Army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flats. Engines incapacitated by heat ray. All crashed. One enemy machine destroyed. Enemy now discharging heavy black smoke in direction of... This is New York, New Jersey. This is New York, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reaches South Street. Gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested area. Smoke now spreading over Raymond Boulevard. QX2L. Calling CQ. 2X2L. Calling CQ. 2X2L. Calling 8X3R. Come in, please. This is 8X3R. Coming back at 2X2L. How's reception? H how's reception? Okay, please. Where are you, 8X3R? What's the matter? Where are you? I'm speaking from the roof of the broadcast building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchinson River Parkway still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed 10 minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. People are holding service below us in the cathedral. Now I look down the harbor. All manner of boats, overloaded with fleeing population, pulling out from docks. Streets all jammed. Noise and crowds like New Year's Eve in city. Wait a minute. 
Enemy now in sight above the Palisades. Five, five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, wading the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. Bulletins handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Seem to be timed in space. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. His steel, cowlish head is even with the skyscrapers. He waits for the others. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out. Black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running towards the East River. Thousands of them. Dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People trying to run away from it, but it's no use. It's falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. 100 yards away. It's 50 feet. Listening to a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. these notes on paper. I'm obsessed by the thought that I may be the last living man on earth. I have been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures in the world now seems part of another life, a life that has no continuity with the present furtive existence of the lonely derelict who pencils these words on the back of some astronomical notes bearing the signature of Richard Pearson. I look down at my blackened hands, my torn shoes, my tattered clothes, and I try to connect them with a professor who lives at Princeton and who, on the night of October 30th, glimpsed through his telescope an orange splash of light on a distant planet. My wife, my colleagues, my students, my books, my observatory, my... my world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I, Richard Pearson? What day is it? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands left to wind the clocks? In writing down my daily life, I tell myself, I shall preserve human history between the dark covers of this little book that was meant to record the movements of the stars. But to write, I must live, and to live, I must eat. I find moldy bread in the kitchen and an orange not too spoiled to swallow. I keep watch at the window. From time to time, I catch sight of a Martian above the black smoke. The smoke still holds the house in its black coil, but at length there is a hissing sound, and suddenly I see a Martian mounted on his machine, spraying the air with a jet of steam, as if to dissipate the smoke. 
I watch in a corner as his huge metal legs nearly brush against the house. Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. It's morning. Morning. Sun screams in the window. The black cloud of gas is lifted, and the scorched meadows to the north look as though a black snowstorm has passed over them. I venture from the house. I make my way to a road. No traffic. Here and there, a wrecked car, baggage overturned, a blackened skeleton. I push on north. For some reason, I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them, and I keep a careful watch. I have seen the Martians feed. Should one of their machines appear over the top of the trees, I am ready to fling myself flat on the earth. I come to a chestnut tree. October chestnuts are ripe. I fill my pockets. I must keep alive. Two days I wander in a vague, northerly direction through a desolate world. Finally, I notice a living creature, a small red squirrel in a beech tree. I stare at him and wonder. He stares back at me. I believe at that moment the animal and I shared the same emotion, the joy of finding another living being. I push on north. I find dead cows in a brackish field. Beyond, the charred ruins of a dairy. The silo remains standing guard over the wasteland like a lighthouse deserted by the sea. Astride the silo perches a weathercock. The arrow points north. Next day I came to a city, vaguely familiar in its contours, yet its buildings strangely dwarfed and leveled off, as if a giant had sliced off its highest towers with a capricious sweep of his hand. I reached the outskirts. I found Newark, undemolished but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians. Presently, with an odd feeling of being watched, I caught sight of something crouching in a doorway. I made a step towards it, and it rose up and became a man, a man armed with a large knife. Star, where'd you come from? I come from many places. A long time ago from Princeton. Princeton, huh? That's near Grover's Mill? Yes. Grover's Mill. <laughs> There's no food here. This is my country. All this end of town, down to the river. There's only food for one. Which way are you going? I don't know. I guess I'm looking for... for people. What's that? Did you hear something just then? Uh, only a bird. A live bird? You get to know that birds have shadows these days. Say, we're in the open here. Let's crawl into this doorway and talk. Have you seen any Martians? Nah. We've gone over to New York. At night, the sky is alive with the lights. Just as if people were still living in it. By daylight, you can't see them. Five days ago, a couple of them carried something big across the flats from the airport. I believe they're learning how to fly. Fly? Yeah, fly. Then it's all over with humanity. Stranger, there's still you and I. Two of us left. They got themselves in solid. They wrecked the greatest country in the world. Those green stars... They're probably falling somewhere every night. We've only lost one machine. There's nothing to do. We're done. We licked. Where were you? You're in the uniform. Yeah, what's left of it? I was in the militia, National Guard. That's good. Wasn't any war any more than there's war between men and ants. And we're eatable ants. I found that out. What will they do with us? I've thought it all out. Right now we're caught as we're wanted. The Martians only has to go a few miles to get a crowd in the run. But they won't keep doing that. They'll begin catching us systematically, keeping the best and storing us in cages and things. They haven't begun on us yet. Not begun? Not begun. All this happened so far is because... We don't have sense enough to keep quiet, bothering them with guns and such stuff and losing our heads and rushing off in crowds. 
Now, instead of our rushing around blind, we've got to fix ourselves up. Fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. Cities, nations, civilization, progress. Done. But if that's so, what is there to live for? Well, there won't be any more concerts for a million years or so. And no nice little dinners at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after, I guess the game's up. And what is there left? Life. That's what. I want to live. Yeah, and so do you. We're not going to be exterminated, and I don't mean to be caught either, and tamed, and fattened, and bred like an ox. What are you going to do? I'm going on. Right under their feet. I got a plan. We men as men are finished. We don't know enough. We gotta learn plenty before we've got a chance. And we've got to live and keep free while we learn, see? I thought it all out, see? Tell me the rest. Well, it isn't all of us that were made for wild beasts, and that's what it's got to be. That's why I watched you. All these little office workers that used to live in these houses, yeah, they'd be no good. They haven't any stuff to them. They just used to run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running wild to catch their commuter train in the morning for fear they'd get canned if they didn't. Running back at night, afraid they won't be in time for dinner. Lives insured and a little invested in case of accidents. And on Sundays, worried about the hereafter. The Martians will be a godsend for those guys. Nice roomy cages, good food, careful breeding, no worries. After a week or so, chasing about the fields on empty stomachs, they'll come and be glad to be caught. You've thought it all out, haven't you? You bet I have. That isn't all. These Martians will make pets of some of them, train them to do tricks. Who knows? Get sentimental over the pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. And some, maybe, they'll train to hunt us. No, that's impossible. No human being. Yes, they will. There's men who'll do it gladly. If one of them ever comes after me, why... In the meantime, you and I and others like us, where are we to live when the Martians own the Earth? I've got it all figured out. We'll live underground. I've been thinking about the sewers. Under New York are miles and miles of them. I mean, one's big enough for anybody. Then there's cellars, vaults, underground storerooms, railway tunnels, subways. You begin to see, eh? And we'll get a bunch of strong men together, no weak ones. That rubbish, out. And you meant me to go? Well, I gave you a chance, didn't I? We won't quarrel about that. Go on. And we've got to make safe places for us to stay in, see? And get all the books we can. Science books. That's where men like you come in, see? We'll raid the museums. We'll even spy on the Martians. It may not be so much we have to learn before. Well, just imagine this. Four or five of their own fighting machines suddenly start off. He grades right and left, and not a Martian in them. Not a Martian in them, but men. Men who've learned the way how. It may even be in our time. Gee. Imagine having one of them lovely things with its heat ray wide and free. We'd turn it on the Martians. We'd turn it on men. We'd bring everybody down to their knees. That's your plan? You and me. And a few more of us. We'd own the world. I see. Say, what's the matter? Where are you going? Not to your world. Goodbye, stranger. After parting with the artilleryman, I came at last to the Holland Tunnel. I entered that silent tube, anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I came out of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. I reached 14th Street, and there again were black powder and several bodies, and an evil, ominous smell from the gratings of the cellars of some of the houses. I wandered up through the 30s and 40s, I stood alone on Times Square. I caught sight of a lean dog running down 7th Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in his jaws and a pack of starving mongrels at his heels. 
He made a wide circle around me as though he feared I might prove a fresh competitor. I walked up Broadway in the direction of that strange powder, past silent shop windows displaying their mute wares to empty sidewalks. Past the Capitol Theater, silent, dark. Past a shooting gallery, where a row of empty guns faced an arrested line of wooden ducks. Near Columbus Circle, I noticed models of 1939 motor cars in the showrooms facing empty streets. From over the top of the General Motors building, I watched a flock of black birds circling in the sky. I hurried on. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine, standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. An insane idea, I rushed recklessly across Columbus Circle and into the park. I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street. From there I could see, standing in a silent row along the mall, 19 of those great metal titans, their cowls empty, their great steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those machines. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to an immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground, and there before my eyes, stark and silent, lay the Martians with the hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh from their dead bodies. Later, when their bodies were examined in the laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared, slain after all man's defenses had failed by the humblest thing that God in his wisdom put upon this earth. Before the cylinder fell, there was a general persuasion that through all the deep of space, no life existed beyond the petty surface of our minute sphere. Now we see further. Dim and wonderful is a vision I have conjured up in my mind of life spreading slowly from this little seabed of the solar system throughout the inanimate vastness of sidereal space, but that is a remote dream. It may be that the destruction of the Martians is only a reprieve, to them, and not to us, is the future ordained, perhaps. Strange, it now seems, to sit in my peaceful study at Princeton, writing down this last chapter of the record begun at a deserted farm in Grover's Mill. Strange to see from my window the university spires, dim and blue through an April haze. Strange to watch children playing in the streets. Strange to see young people strolling on the green, where the new spring grass heals the last black scars of a bruised earth. Strange to watch the sightseers enter the museum where the disassembled parts of a Martian machine are kept on public view. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it, bright and clean cut, hard and silent, under the dawn of that last great day. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen. To assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. Cheering tales for Dark Knight's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying, boo. Starting now, we couldn't stop all of your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night. So we did the best next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed our production facilities. You will be relieved. I hope to learn that we didn't mean it, and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That green, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian. It's Halloween. Tonight, Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and its affiliated stations, Coast to Coast, have brought you The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, the latest in its series of dramatic broadcasts. Stay tuned in upcoming weeks as we present additional dramatizations of spine-tingling short stories. This is Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening and happy Halloween.